time on the hit list, we celebrate the success of some of the biggest bands of all time. It's impossible to sum up the Fab Four's influence on music and popular culture in just a few minutes. Nearly half a century after coming together, the Beatles remain at number one on Rolling Stone magazine's list of greatest artists of all time, having sold more than a billion records worldwide. According to the same magazine, their groundbreaking music and style helped define the 1960s. To this day, they remain the biggest selling band in America. Concert promoter Sid Bernstein believes it was the group's charm and spirit that won over the notoriously tough to crack US market. And here along came four guys full of mirth, merriment, songs, songs that fitted the times and the needs of people their age. People just entering maturity, and they had a message that meant something for these teenagers. Sid masterminded their historic concert at New York Stadium that took pop concerts from theaters into multi-thousand seater sports arenas. When they made their debut, their American debut at Carnegie Hall, which seats 2,830 people to go from 2,830 to 55,000, and we turned people away from there, too. So it was, it was monumental. The show opened with the Beatles performing Twist and Shout. Not that anyone heard it. The PA sound system turned out to be no match for the hysterical screaming of the teenage girls that packed the stadium to the rafters, many of whom fainted during the band's 30-minute drowned-out set. Not being able to hear themselves play was something they'd had to get used to since Beatlemania had taken over the UK in 1963, after the release of the debut album Please Please Me. After conquering the US the following year with the single I Wanna Hold Your Hand, they were on their way to becoming, as John Lennon put it, more popular than Jesus. As the decade progressed, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison and Ringo Starr ditched the pudding bowl haircuts and suits to embrace the hippie movement and psychedelia. The frivolity of their early releases also gave way to more political songs, and Elvis Presley famously criticized the group for their anti-war activism and open use of drugs. The Beatles gave their last performance together on the rooftop of their record company's building on the 30th of January 1969, and the band officially broke up in May 1970 leaving a musical legacy that is never likely to be eclipsed. With the Beatles churning out their family-friendly Mersey beat to chart-topping effect in the 60s, the Rolling Stones opted to pioneer a more gritty blues-based rock and roll that went on to form the basis of hard rock. By the end of the decade, they'd crowned themselves the world's greatest rock and roll band, and Mick Jagger's macho showmanship, with plenty of camp irony thrown in, more than lived up to the arrogance of that claim. Always flirting with the seedy side of rock and roll, late 60s British newsreels were awash with stories of arrests and drugs charges. While Mick and Keith Richards both had their run-ins with the law, it was the Stones' founder guitarist Brian Jones who spiralled out of control. Just weeks after being fired from the band in 1969, he was found dead in his own swimming pool. The early 70s saw continued troubles with drugs and the law for Keith Richards, Mick's marriage to Bianca, the release of Sticky Fingers, and a period of tax exile in France. In 1974, Ron Wood joined the lineup of Mick, Keith, Charlie Watts, and Bill Wyman. And while other 60s bands were falling by the wayside, the Stones kept rolling out the albums. With the records ebbing and flowing in terms of critical and commercial success, their live gigs were becoming an increasingly hot ticket. In the 80s, a fallout between Mick and Keith about the band's direction led to a drop-off in inspiration, with both of them branching out into solo careers. Mick's high-profile marriage to model Jerry Hall and rumoured affairs had all but eclipsed the music, 
and by 1991, Bill Wyman had had enough and left to pursue other interests. He was replaced by bassist Daryl Jones, who helped the Stones make one of their best-received albums in years. 1994's Voodoo Lounge went on to spawn an even bigger tour, and with the main players in the band all pushing 50, their record company EMI were only too happy to sign them up for a mega deal that kept them under contract for another 14 years. Since then, Mick may have put a dent in the Rock and Roll Rebel Act by accepting a knighthood, but in the wake of their mega Bigger Bang tour of 2007 and Martin Scorsese's recent documentary, the Rolling Stones have proved that they are still the greatest live act of all time. I'm not right there yet, so I'm enjoying what I'm doing, so that would be great. I'm really not worrying about when I'm stopping. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it in my wheelchair, and so will he. The story of Ireland's most famous rock band began in Dublin in 1976, when 14-year-old Larry Mullen Jr. pinned a note on the school notice board looking for musicians to join a band. Seven musicians turned up to the first band practice in Mullen's parents' kitchen. Among them were Paul Hewson, Dave Evans and Adam Clayton. Along with Larry, these three teenagers went on to become U2 and Paul's teenage nickname of Bono stuck. Apparently, it's derived from a Latin expression meaning good voice. U2 hit the big time in 1983 with the album War, which went to number one in the UK. And by 1985, the band's commitment to political and social causes was sealed with their stadium-rousing performance at London's Live Aid. According to Rolling Stone magazine, their next album, The Joshua Tree, propelled them from heroes to superstars. It won them their first two Grammy Awards and has gone to sell over 25 million copies. After the relatively poor reception of more experimental albums like Zuropa and Pop, they claim to be reapplying for the job of best band in the world with the release of their next album, All That You Can't Leave Behind, which earned them three Grammy Awards. Since then, they've stuck to a more conventional rock sound and have enjoyed continued chart and critical success. Alongside his work with the band, Bono has carved a name for himself as a political activist and has become a powerful agitator in the name of ending poverty. His passionate and tireless commitment has earned him audiences with some of the world's most powerful leaders, and in 2005, he was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year, alongside Bill and Melinda Gates. Just, you know, to use your star power for people who have no power at all, it's got to be a good thing. I mean, I'm as sick of celebrities as the next man, and I am one, I suppose, although that, I hate that word. But, you know, it's ridiculous to have this thing called celebrity, but it's currency, and, and I want to spend mine wisely. Meanwhile, as the frontman of the second most successful stadium rock act after the Rolling Stones, he claims it's all about the songs. You know, when people are screaming and roaring and, and shouting, it's, it, it, you know, the humbling thing is to realise it's not really for the, for, for the band or for any band or any artist on the stage. It's for their connection with those songs. People, including myself, you know, a song just can own you. In their glittery lycra bodysuits, shoulder pads and silver boots, Swedish supergroup ABBA, whose name was derived from the first letter of each of the four members' names, were never cool. I do cringe sometimes. <laughs> I, I have to admit that. But, but we did it, you know, just to look outrageous. It wasn't, that, it wasn't exactly our taste. It was just something we thought we had to do. But even if you've never been a fan, you're still likely to know all the words to Dancing Queen. Benny's infectious hooks and Bjorn's catchy lyrics, brought to life by the irrepressible vocals of Anifrid and Agneta, amounted to an irresistible force of nature, so much greater than the sum of its parts. Anything in the charts was absolutely forbidden if you wanted to be cool. But they were there, and constantly, and I, I think I... It, secretly really love them and, and like it or not they've been a soundtrack to things that happen 
to pretty well everybody, really, for the last 30 years. The proof of that statement lies in the fact that ABBA still sell two to four million records a year. Their continued popularity has also been borne out by the unbelievable success of the stage musical Mamma Mia, which is based on a swag of their hit songs. Since opening in 1999, the show has grossed over $2 billion and been seen by over 30 million people. And in 2008, it was turned into a multi-million dollar film starring Colin Firth, Meryl Streep and Julie Walters. For the first time in many years, all four members of ABBA turned out as a group for the film's premiere in Sweden. But that didn't mean they were about to announce a comeback. <laughs> Not even if you did that, no. I, I, I don't see that happening at all. It's, it's never going to happen again. Uh, because I think it's too long, it's been too long now. I mean, we split up in 81 and, and people haven't seen us as a group since then. And it, it'll come as such a, you know, disappointment to them. So. <laughs> Perhaps the size of Coldplay's success has something to do with the size of their ambition. In order for us to get excited about a, a new album, we have to have one song that we feel like everybody has to hear this song before we die, otherwise we'll be terribly depressed. But for the band's chief songwriter and frontman, it isn't about selling records. My expectation isn't really one of an amounts of albums or amounts of awards or anything like that. It's more that I would just really love it if a few people said to me that it really meant something to them. That was actually what I would really love. Having topped the UK charts with their first three albums, they'd also won a cabinet full of Grammys, Brits and NME awards, with songs like Yellow, Clocks and The Scientist branded as classics by critics. I think everything that happens to you impacts your songwriting. From being turned down by some girl when you're 13 to <clears throat> worrying about, you know, whether your friends, you know, like you or your, your, or your friend losing somebody or, you know, a cup of tea you had, you know, er everything goes into your brain, doesn't it? And so it, it's all mixed up in there. Despite being inundated with multi-million dollar offers from the likes of Gatorade and Gap for the use of their songs in ads, Coldplay have steadfastly refused to sell out nor will they be pressured into rushing out albums to cash in on their popularity. We won't do another album until we think we've written the best songs in history. And that could take a while. So we could be waiting 20 years or 50 years. Uh, who knows? On the eve of the release of their fourth album, Viva La Vida or Death and All His Friends, expectations were high. We wanted to find someone who had the same effect uh, on us as Brian Eno did on U2 and David Bowie and Talking, Talking Heads, Heads and one of all these incredible bands that we love. And so we asked Brian, do you know anyone who could help us in the same way that you did? Uh, and he said, well, I could, you know, I wouldn't mind having a go. With Brian at the helm, Chris abandoned his famous falsetto style and started exploring his lower vocal register. And the album, packed with Hispanic influences, went on to win the 2009 Grammy Award for Best Rock Album. After spending several years as the guitar technician for the Inspiral Carpets, Noel Gallagher returned to Manchester to find that his kid brother Liam had formed a band. Noel allegedly agreed to join if he could take complete control of the group, including writing all the songs. The rest of the band agreed. After playing a handful of small club gigs, Oasis cornered Alan McGee, the head of Creation Records, and forced him to listen to their demo. Impressed, he signed the band, and Oasis shot from obscurity to stardom with their debut album Definitely Maybe in 1994, and went on to become embroiled in a much-hyped duel with fellow Brit poppers Blur. At the height of their fame in 1997, their third album, Be Here Now, reached number one in the UK charts and number two in the US. It also became the fastest-selling album in chart history. 
as well as becoming one of the most critically and commercially successful British bands of the decade, they also attracted their fair share of headlines for their famously bad behaviour. You'd always stuck with the image that you create in the first place, so we'll always be loudmouth yobos from Manchester who take drugs, sniff glue, drink beer and shag loads birth. During their eventful tour of 2000, arguments between the brothers resulted in a walkout by Noel, who eventually rejoined the band for the Irish and British legs of the tour. Although Liam has since claimed that they no longer have a personal relationship, he's learned how to get along with his big brother. You know, we don't go for walks in the park, you know, we don't go and sit, you know, we feed each other popcorn in a cinema, you know what I mean? We just do what we do when we need to speak about... The thing is about me and our kid, there's no in it anymore, you know what I mean? There's no just whatever needs to be said, we say it. And then he goes and does his thing and I do my thing. In 2005, their sixth album, Don't Believe the Truth, became their best-selling and best-received album since the mid-90s, selling 65,000 records in the first week in the States. The resurgence of their popularity led to a 2007 Brit Award for Outstanding Contribution to Music. The following year, their seventh studio album, Dig Out Your Soul, won them an NME Award for Best Band. Despite enjoying great critical success and selling millions of records throughout their career, the Red Hot Chili Peppers had to wait 23 years to see one of their albums debut at number one in the US. 2006's Stadium Arcadium, produced by Rick Rubin, took over 18 months to complete and was recorded in the same studio as their acclaimed 1991 album, Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Started hearing melodies and lyrics and one of the lyrics was Stadium Arcadium and as I started writing about what that was, it turned out to be a, a place in nature where people could gather and listen to music at nighttime together and be connected and in some way create a type of light that would be reflective of the light from the heavens. And it was just a moment of feeling connected to the universe by way of music and by way of people listening to music together. And that's kind of the idea of Stadium Arcadium. It turned out to be a very inspiring concept. We went in the rehearsal studio and wrote 38 songs. Um, and that was just what came out. Um, it was a really creative period, but the idea was to make a normal size record. But as we were putting the songs together and um, uh, arranging them and, and, and putting final touches on, on the arrangements of the songs, we just kept writing and writing and writing more songs. It just kept coming out. You can't stop something like that. 28 of those songs ended up on the double album, which went on to win the Chili's seven Grammy nominations and the award for best rock album. Frontman Anthony Kiedis put the success down to the improved relationships within the band, which first came together under the name of Tony Flo and the magically majestic Masters of Mayhem back in 1983. Many creative differences and battles with drug addiction later, Anthony is happily surrounded by fellow core members John Frusciante, Michael Flea Balzeri and Chad Smith, who recently kicked off a world tour with a mini gig in Barcelona. It's a good decision for us. We're excited to open our tour in Barcelona. So we'll be back in a couple of months doing a real show and uh, we'll be pouring out all of our hearts and brains. The tour took in three consecutive gigs at London's Hyde Park much to their British fans' delight. The Chili's are awesome. They're the best band in the world. In 2002, a poll by the Guinness Book of Records found that Queen's 1975 hit Bohemian Rhapsody was Britain's favourite single of all time. Beating John Lennon's Imagine into second spot, the Queen classic was a clear winner in a poll of more than 31,000 votes. I think nobody could second-guess no. that, 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 kind of, um, that kind of popularity, but we just thought we were making a very interesting record at the time. We didn't know it would become sort of public wallpaper, but, you know, it, it, yeah, we thought it was an interesting record, but we didn't even think it was going to be a single when we made it. The seven-minute tribute to opera written by Freddie Mercury 
broke all the rules of pop music. We regarded it as an adventure, I think. You know, we did like pushing the frontiers of recording possibilities forward. And at the time, no one had ever been able to do that. There weren't enough tracks on the tape. Almost a surprise in the early days that it got off the ground in 75 simply because radio stations didn't play seven minute long uh, records at that uh, point. It, uh, it managed because it was so brilliant and it had so many quirky twists and turns in the uh, lyrics and the music uh, to actually get on and get played. Bohemian Rhapsody from Queen's fourth album remains a wonderful illustration of the overt theatricality of flamboyant lead singer Freddie Mercury, who died in 91 of AIDS-related pneumonia. After his death, the band re-released Bohemian Rhapsody, which went straight to number one in the UK and earned a million pounds for AIDS research. Since then, Brian May and Roger Taylor have continued writing, recording and performing under the name of Queen, with guest vocalists such as Paul Rogers. And the die-hard fans have accepted the band will never find another Freddie. I don't think it can be replaced, but he's... It can't be replaced, but he's as good as they can get. Yeah, no, no one can ever replace him. They've also collaborated with writer and comedian Ben Elton, to produce the hit stage musical We Will Rock You, which features many of Queen's greatest hits, like Under Pressure, Killer Queen, and Crazy Little Thing Called Love. Asked whether Freddie would have approved of seeing his songs adapted for the stage, Brian was confident in his response. Definitely, yeah, he would have contributed a lot. Sometimes we kind of second guess Freddie and we think, oh, well, what, what, what would Freddie do here? Um, so we think his spirit is very much in it, yeah. Rather like ABBA, British band Dire Straits never impressed fashionistas with their sartorial style. Their penchant for headbands and baggy shirts smacked more of a local pub band than a stadium rock act. And their nice guy image flew in the face of snarling punk groups like the Sex Pistols and The Clash. And to begin with, the four-piece formed by Mark Knopfler and his brother David in 1977 were doing it tough as their name suggested. I was selling guitars to, to, to live and sleeping on people's floors and things. But even then, Mark had a feeling Dire Straits were destined for something great. I knew it was going to happen one way or the other, yeah. After finding British success with their debut single, Sultans of Swing, their record company Warner Brothers thought their middle-of-the-road rock sound might also go down well in the US. It soon became clear they were right. I think Dire Straits was the first record that they'd had from a, from a British band for some time by a new British band, which, which was air playable, was programmable as far as they were concerned, because it sounds like an American record. Their self-titled album sold two million copies in the US alone and led to a world tour. We arrived in America to a completely sold out tour, to complete press mania, uh, and media overkill, if anything. And you sometimes flip around six stations and you'd get one of our songs was being played simultaneously on every air, air band you could get. That worldwide popularity continued through the release of their next four albums, which spawned hit singles like Romeo and Juliet, Private Investigations, Walk of Life and Money for Nothing. It gets really silly when something happens uh, worldwide. So that size of that size and there's an awful lot of attention. However, after the phenomenally successful world tour of 1986 to promote Brothers in Arms, Mark decided it was time to take a break from the group. I re distinctly remember lying on a bed and saying, enough. <laughs> he took time off to concentrate on side projects. And although the band reformed briefly in 1991 to release their final studio album on every street, Mark has since been ploughing his efforts into lower profile pursuits, such as producing for other artists and writing film scores.